Good morning, everyone. I hope you can all hear me. Um, hello and welcome to this first stakeholder forum conference of the Papillons project, which stands for Plastic in Agricultural Production, Impacts, Life Cycles, and Long-Term Sustainability. My name is Sabolch, and I am a research assistant at Farm Europe, which is uh, the VP for Communication, Dissemination, and Exploitation for this project. And I have the pleasure of moderating today's discussion on the micro nanoplastics in general and specifically in agricultural soils. I hope you are all connected and logged in and uh, happy to be with us. Uh, we are very happy to welcome you all on behalf of all the members of the Papillons Consortium, including Dr. Luca Nizato, who is here with us today, our project coordinator, and he will brief you with his intervention later on and do the conclusion as well. Um, speaking of interventions, you may find our program of interventions for today on the next slide, uh, which will feature speeches from a diverse composition of institutions, such as the European Parliament, the European Commission, uh, the European Chemicals Agency, the European Food Safety Authority, agricultural plastic and farming organizations. Um, and if that sounds a bit packed, well, that's because it is. Uh, there are plenty of questions in the world of micro nanoplastics where we still need research to be done. So I would like to ask everyone to stick to their allocated time slots. This is very important and key as we want to make sure that everyone's voice can be heard. So that is for that to have a rich discussion. Furthermore, uh, I will try to make sure to keep everyone in line with some moderation. So when your time is up, I will try to make small gestures to make sure that you know about it by raising my hand in the Zoom function. Speaking of uh, the Zoom functions, and first of all, some housekeeping rules, which I am sure all of you are very familiar by now, uh, but just in case for reassurance. So as you know, uh, we would like to ask you to keep your camera on when you are speaking and off when you are not. Mute your microphone when not speaking, of course, to not have an echo. And please use headphones uh, with microphones if possible to make sure that we can hear you better. Furthermore, as Raisa, my colleague, has already put in the chat, uh, make sure that you ask your questions in the chat. Don't for a worry, all of them will be answered either right here in the session or later on in answer during uh, a later stage. We will have the Q&A session at the end. And as you could see, this video meeting is being recorded and hopefully will be distributed later on. Um, furthermore, regarding the speakers, we have received all your presentations, so thank you very much for that. But just in case, uh, to make sure, uh, you can present it yourself, but if you'd like, we can present it as well. So it's up to you, just please let us know in advance. Um, also, regarding the questions, just please make sure to keep it short and concise and to address it to someone specific if you want to make sure that he or she answers the question. We also encourage you to tweet about the event for having an online discussion using the hashtag Papillons kickoff. And just to remind you, the objective of this meeting is to indeed have a discussion with key stakeholders in the policy, farming and industry sectors and to map their perspective about our research project. Um, so before we jump in to all these interventions and uh, the research project itself, we wanted to give and have a little feedback from your side with a wake up Slido questionnaire. You can get your smartphones uh, go to slido.com and use the number 322745, where you will find a little wake up questionnaire to kickstart the meeting.
Can I share my screen, please, Anna? Because right now I can share, share it while the other participant is sharing, just to make sure that everyone gets to the slide of itself as well. Perfect. Exactly. Why are you joining us today is the first warm up question. To learn more and to be a speaker, those are very good answers. We are very happy to have the speakers with us once again. Interest in plastic pollution field, your interest will hopefully be fulfilled. To learn, yes, we will all learn hopefully a lot. Okay, to hear the speakers, correct. To understand problems of plastic in nature and microplastics. Well, I'm happy to say you are at the right place then. Now moving on, just to see, learn how to improve plastic regulation. Exactly, that is one objective of the project, which Mr. Nizepto will talk about. Now, just to ask, where are you from? Are you from academia and research, policy and governance and regulation, industry, farming and agriculture, civil sector and NGOs, or something different? So far, academia is in the lead, but I see the others are gaining fruitful as well. Looks like academia just can be beaten in this field. Okay, but I see some industry representatives, a couple of farmers and civil sectors. So that's nice to have as well. But it looks like it will be a meeting of academia. Okay, moving on now to the next one. It's just a quick yes or no, if you have heard about the Horizon 2020 projects before or not, just to know how much depth do we need to go on. But regarding the previous answers, I'm pretty sure yes, we'll have a significant win, which is great. Perfect. For the answer is 93%. I think we don't even need then the second question, but just to be sure, if have you participated as a stakeholder in any of the Horizon 2020 research programs before? But given that many of the people, most people have already said, yes, they know about, maybe they have indeed participated in some before. Oh, but this one looks to be more of an equal Okay, it looks like we're at a 60-40% for yes. Furthermore, just a question from our side to let us know how did you hear about the Papillons project? Was it a word of mouth through the European Commission, from a newsletter, from our website, social media, or, or other? Seems like the word of mouth is, cannot be beaten even in the digital times. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. And then overall, how much, if anything, do you know about the Papillon's purpose and objectives? Would you say, you know, a great deal, a fair amount, not very much, just not at all to start with, too early to say, or you don't have an opinion. It's a bit of a feedback for us to know how deep your understanding is. Cool. 
great. It seems like most people are familiar already with the project, which is good to know. And last but not least, how much of an issue do you think that the micro nanoplastics represent in agricultural soils? The options are the same, so a fair amount, a great deal, not very much, not at all, or if you don't know, you don't have an opinion. Perfect. So far, it seems a great deal and a fair amount, which I'm very glad to know. So we'll stop sharing now, because if indeed micro nanoplastics is an issue, I believe it is time for our speakers to let us know how big of an issue it is. Thank you for all your answers. So we will move now to our first intervention today, who is MEP Simona Bonafe from the European Parliament. She has sent us a video message on the role of the European Parliament's previous work in the field of plastics. So please let us watch it now with me. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be talking to you today at the kickoff meeting of the Papillons projects. Uh, as you might already know by now, the Papillons research project investigate the sustainability of agricultural plastics uh, in relation to uh, releases and impacts uh, of the microplastics and nanoplastics in Europe soils. As a shadow rapporteur of the European Parliament uh, on the European strategy for the plastics in a circular economy, I am pleased to see that there is uh, a strong interest uh, around the subject uh, with such committed researchers and stakeholders. Uh, this is key as I believe. Oh, we have a bit of a lag, I see. But worry not, bear with us, there's more of the message to come. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to be talking to you today at the kickoff meeting of the Papillons projects. Uh, as you might already know by now, the Papillons research project investigate the sustainability of agricultural plastics uh, in relation to uh, releases and impacts uh, of the microplastics and nanoplastics in Europe soils. Uh, as a shadow rapporteur of the European Parliament uh, on the European strategy for the plastics in a circular economy, I am pleased to see that there is uh, a strong interest uh, around the subject uh, with such committed researchers and stakeholders. Uh, this is key, as I believe uh, that the work on plastic uh, has to continue. Uh, in the European Parliament, uh, we have uh, already called for concrete measures uh, to make sure that plastics uh, are designed, produced, used and managed uh, according to the principles of circular economy. For too long, we have had uh, on the market too much plastics uh, that we couldn't reuse uh, or recycle. These ended up in landfill, in incinerators, uh, or lost uh, uh, on land or in the seas uh, with a major economic impact uh, on tourism or fishing. Nevertheless, it is important to remember that the majority of plastics uh, are produced, consumed and disposed on, of, uh, on land, uh, which makes the accumulation of plastic in agriculture lands uh, a concern for all of us. Let me remind uh, you all that um, healthy soil ecosystems are uh, as well essential for achieving the objectives of the European Green Deal. For a sustainable and efficient transition, scientific research is essential and can contribute to the management and development of sustainable plastic, uh, thus protecting human health and the environment. This is why I very much welcome this timely research project uh, and dialogue on the role of plastic uh, within our land. 
I look forward to all interested stakeholders join the Papillon's research project in order to close the existing knowledge gaps and to make sure that our soils can be as healthy as possible uh, thanks to our common efforts. I hope that the project uh, manages both uh, to raise awareness on the importance of the topic and to share and spread best practices in order for Europe to inspire and endorse innovation both in soil protection and agriculture practices. Thank you very much. I wish you all a successful event and a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was Ms. Simona Bonafé from the European Parliament wishing us an excellent session. And in order to do so, I will now give the floor to Ms. Marta Iglesias from the European Commission to give some of her reflections on the topic. Please. Yes, <laughs> thank you. Good morning. And thank you for this invitation to this first stakeholder conference of the Papillon project, which I assume is part of the kickoff activities of the project. So I congratulate you to gather such a good uh, variety of stakeholders around the table, and I very much look forward for the discussion. So just to remind you, I work in the Commission in Digiri Agriculture in the field of research and innovation. And uh, I attended the, at the kickoff a meeting that we had also, uh, how long ago already? <laughs> Some time ago already. And I just want to, say, to just remind you that this uh, project was funded in the, in the context of our efforts to, to tackle the problem of land degradation, in particular due to plastic pollution, and also to assess these socioeconomic consequences and the, the need to keep uh, soils in good conditions for agriculture and for the environment. So you have already read in several places, but uh, there's more plastics in farm soils than in the seas and oceans, which is something that maybe not be obvious for everybody around the table when they said that there was not an issue for agriculture. Let me tell you that it is an issue. And the impacts on soil biodiversity, food safety, human health are not really known yet. So it is very important to close this knowledge gap, which is the, the, the task of this project, and also to, to assess the effects and the fate of micro and nanoplastics eh, and other stressors on soils. So uh, you probably have a sense that uh, lately soil health has been gaining more and more attention, uh, not only in the media and social networks, but also in the policies of the European heart, let's say, in particular the Green Deal and in the strategies, the biodiversity strategy and its upcoming soil strategy, the farm to fork or the soil, uh, um, the zero pollution strategy. But I also want to say that on the 29th of September, finally, the, the, the mission in the area of soil, food and health has been fully launched under the name A Soil Deal for Europe. Uh, this mission was uh, already published and together with the mission implementation plan. The implementation plan is a document that we elaborate by the Commission services, not only DG Agri, but all the commission, most of all were also taking part in this uh, drafting. And it will just uh, outline how the mission is going to be deployed. So for those who are not uh, familiar maybe with the concept of the EU missions, this is a new instrument under the Horizon Europe. And it's uh, conceived as a way to bring science closer to citizens to show that research and innovation indeed can help to solve major societal problems. So back to the mission, the soil deal for Europe. I think it is already relevant for, for the Green Deal and in particular some of the Green Deal strategies mention the soil mission as an instrument to implement to achieve their targets. For example, they use the reduced use of pesticides and fertilizers or the nutrient to reduce the nutrient loss or to prevent the microplastic pollution in soils. All this requires an action in the way we manage we manage our soils and this is part of the mission uh, activities so the mission has a big goal which is to to increase significantly increase this uh, 20 this 30 40 percent of soil, healthy soils that we have now in in europe uh, and and in the second i mean in another hand they are also um 
will help to achieve the Green Deal targets by 2030. So the mission is uh, back with eight uh, big objectives that addresses main soil challenges, including soil pollution. And for each of these uh, objectives, we have a uh, proposed quantified target and measurable indicators. So it is important to just to mention that the soil mission is not limited to agricultural soils, but also is aiming to improve soil health for all types of soils, including urban settings. Uh, the mission will have a, what we call a hot spot on soil contamination and restoration. So these hot spots are like cluster of activities in areas which we consider strategic for the mission. And these uh, hot spots will show how bottom-up solutions and business involvement are for testing a, um, a wide range of approaches to, to, to find solutions can, can work. And the activities will be to remediate pollution in soils, notably from pesticides, heavy metals, but also microplastics. And it will call for a, a partnership between land managers, of course, including farmers, but also urban gardeners, fertilizers and pesticides companies, bio bias industries and waste managers. So somehow you have already today gathered these key actors around the table. So I thought it was very great this start uh, of this, this uh, event. So I will just finalize to say that we have great expectation from, from this project. We, we hope that you will end up providing this necessary knowledge for farmers and and, and the way they, they manage their lands and their input, and also innovations to fully tackle these problems of plastic footprints in agriculture, but also considering the socioeconomic and environmental consequences. With this, I just want to congratulate this first event. I think you have done very well. I'm very much looking forward for the discussions, and I wish you a very successful event. That's from my side. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for all the positive inputs and the information on the soil mission. Great insights received. And now we will move on to our second speaker from the commission, who is here with us from DGMD, I believe, uh, Ms. Celia Forni, whose presentation is titled The Policy Framework on Bio-Based, Biodegradable and Compostable Plastics. Please, the floor is yours, Ms. Forni. Good morning, everyone. And uh, thank you for giving uh, uh, the Commission the opportunity to uh, take part in this event. We are very pleased to, uh, to, 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 to be part of this uh, event because it gives, uh, it gives us the opportunity to talk about our work on plastics in agriculture. Next slide, please. So um, this is a perspective from uh, uh, European Commission, DG Environment, where I work in the directorate responsible for uh, circular economy. I put here uh, some of, uh, of the political context, Martha, my colleague has already mentioned some important strategies that are guiding us in this work. I put here the European Green Deal, of course, the Circular Economy Action Plan, the European Plastics uh, Strategy. Uh, Marta mentioned um, also the Zero Pollution Action Plan, the Biodiversity Strategy. I'm sure you're pretty familiar with this uh, kind of political context, but it's always useful to mention it because uh, it's a true that uh, plastics pollution is important for the European Commission. We are really uh, trying to uh, take care of this and from different perspectives. Today is the kickoff meeting of a research project and we also have uh, great expectations uh, for the results of this project. It will surely help us to know more about this, this type of plastic pollution. Next slide, please. I put here a slide on what is the problem. So um, actually, we, um, we are uh, uh, aiming to adopt a policy framework on bio-based, biodegradable and compostable plastics. This is part of the plastics strategy, is a measure that was uh, foreseen there in order to uh, understand where innovation can help in the fight against plastic pollution and also, of course, soil pollution. Uh, we understand that these markets of bio-based, biodegradable and compostable plastics uh, is a niche market today 
only 1% of total of uh, plastic production capacity, but is growing rapidly. So we wanted to have a, a closer look to it. And we understand from uh, the studies already carried out that there is widespread confusion. When it's a bio, you don't know, you, you think that you know what it is, and then it's much more complex than what it appears. We have, for instance, for the bio-based plastics understood that the actual bio-based content of a product is often not known, and that there are no EU sustainability criteria applying uh, to the feedstock used for the production of these particular plastics, bio-based plastics. And then you have biodegradable and compostable plastics. And there, uh, there is also widespread confusion. The first confusion is between bio-based and biodegradable and compostable plastics. They are not necessarily always the same. And within the family of uh, biodegradable and compostable plastics, there is also widespread confusion in the sense that the large public uh, does not know always what is biodegradable, what is a compostable, what does it mean to, for a material to be biodegradable or compostable. And then we would like to understand better the place of these plastics in a circular economy. And here it's the, uh, the link to the circular economy action plan uh, Mrs. Bonafé just mentioned, uh, we want plastics uh, to be fully circular. Next slide, please. So the objective is, as it is uh, said in the um, action plan uh, on circular economy, uh, the objective is double. We want to understand the source in the labeling, the use of bio-based plastics, and we want to understand the labeling, what, what are the issues related to the labeling and the use of biodegradable and compostable plastics. So these are the two strengths of our work in the GN environment now. So the sourcing, the labeling and use of bio-based plastics and the labeling and the use of biodegradable and compostable plastics. Next slide, please. I put uh, here a slide on biodegradable and compostable plastics because I think that it is important today that we focus uh, within the family of uh, bioplastics uh, on these plastics, so biodegradable and compostable plastics. And here we have already some evidence. I put here two studies, one study um, carried out by a consultant for the European Commission and an opinion issued by the, uh, the chief scientific advisors on biodegradability of plastics in the open environment. So not in industrial composting facilities or home composting facilities, but in nature. And we see here that, for instance, the chief scientific advisors opinion, uh, what, what do they say to us? They say to us that we should prioritize reduction, reuse and recycling of plastics. We should limit the use of these plastics by degradable and compostable to some specific applications only. And that we should not consider biodegradable uh, plastics as a solution for inappropriate waste management or littering. So here we have already, we have already got some evidence some, some, some indications on the way we should address these plastics. The next slide, please. This is a slide on some of the results of the chief scientific advisors and their opinion on biodegradable plastics in the open environment. They have uh, come up with uh, some examples of possible applications for biodegradable and compostable plastics. I say illustrative examples. It's not an exhaustive list of possible applications, but just a few uh, examples of possible applications. And you see that there are agricultural mulch films that are considered as possible applications for these plastics. We will talk uh, later uh, much more in detail about these agroplastics applications. You have other things like fireworks, components of fishing gear, all typically made of conventional polymers and today challenging to collect. Next slide, please. Here I focus on 
uh, today's uh, topic, plastics in agriculture, and the evidence that we have already collected and the gaps, the knowledge gaps, the data gaps that we have also uh, encountered uh, during the work uh, carried out so far. Here there is a study that was uh, carried out uh, by a consultant for the European Commission on conventional and biodegradable plastics in agriculture. So not only biodegradable plastics, but conventional, the large majority, and this part of biodegradable plastics already in use in agriculture by the farmers. These are the preliminary uh, results of the study. They, uh, they were discussed yesterday at an event organized by APE for the European Commission where the results of the study have uh, been discussed. Uh, the focus of the study was on non-packaging agri-plastic waste. And here we have uh, some figures. We see that the 63% of these plastics are reported as collected. This means that the rest, it goes somewhere else and sometimes is not known. The destination, the final destination of such waste is not known, but we know that the, the practice, what, what the practices are. Uh, and then you have 24% of this waste, which is reported as recycled. So low rates of recycling for these plastics in agriculture. And there are no reports of recycling taking place for mulch films and bale nets. Then the study focused and investigated the barriers to collection and recycling across Europe. We understand that the collection could be much higher and the recycling could be much higher. We wanted to understand why this is not done today. Then the, focus, uh, the study focused on the environmental impact of improper collection of, or low rates of uh, collection and uh, recycling. And this is the topic of your research uh, work. And we are very much delighted with your work because it will certainly help us to understand better the environmental impact of improper collection or low rates of collection and recycling. Then the study focused also on the part of biodegradable plastics used in agriculture. We said it's still a niche market, but it's already, these materials are already in use by the farmers across Europe. So we wanted to understand better what are the benefits, of course, and what are the, uh, the, the possible environmental impacts. One of the results of the study is that the certified biodegradable mulch films are an additional choice which is offered with compelling benefits. Then the study uh, provided us with criteria for their use. So when their use is um, beneficial for the environment. And uh, at the end, one of the recommendations of the study to the European Commission for the, for the, the work that will come later is that further research on biodegradable agroplastics is needed. And here again, your work is very timely because it will certainly help us to understand better the long-term environmental impact of, for example, plastic accumulation in soils. When it happens, how it happens, and what we can do to prevent uh, those uh, problems, those impacts. Next slide, please. I said at the beginning that the final objective of our work in DG environment with the collaboration of all relevant DGs in the Commission, starting from a DG Agri, of course, and DG RTD, is the adoption of a policy framework on bio-based, biodegradable and compostable plastics next year in spring. Uh, so what we have already done in order to adopt such a policy framework is a roadmap and we got uh, uh, several feedbacks and we are very pleased with this interest that there is uh, on these plastics and on the impact of uh, possible environmental impact of this plastic. Uh, the next step is a web-based uh, consultation starting possibly in December, so be before the end of the year. It will run for eight, 10 weeks. Let's see for the date of, uh, of the start of the consultation but it's there 
to provide us with further input because we have already carried out many studies. I mentioned a few, the chief scientific advisors, etc. opinion, but we need more. So we want to have now a, a further consultation and we invite all relevant stakeholders to take part in this consultation. There is a part on uh, plastics used in agriculture. Why? Because it is probably the largest portion of plastics that are deliberately put in the open environment. So it is important that we know more before adopting such a policy framework. There are many links with many ongoing initiatives. I mentioned here the implementation of the single-use plastic directive, the revision of the packaging and packaging waste directive, reach where microplastics are addressed uh, with a restriction proposal on uh, intentionally added. We are also looking at the commission at unintentionally released microplastics. So the relevant studies, uh, including yours, uh, and the national experience uh, of countries where these plastics uh, have already entered the market, I'm thinking of Spain, I'm thinking of Italy, we have had uh, dialogue with those uh, stakeholders uh, within the study on agroplastics. Uh, so all these uh, relevant studies and national experience will be taken into account when uh, preparing the policy framework. I will stop here, but I remain, of course, at your disposal for any question you might have on this policy framework on bio-based, biodegradable and compostable plastics. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much this morning for laying down the policy framework and mentioning that plastic pollution is indeed important for the European Commission from multiple perspectives. And speaking of next steps, now comes the presentation of the two research projects for today, funded by indeed the European Commission's Horizon 2020 program. So now I would like to first call the project coordinator of the Papillons project, Dr. Luca Nisdetto, to give his keynote speech. The floor is yours, Luca, please. everyone thank you very much uh, i can share my presentation or um, otherwise we go on like this uh, we'll keep it like this Anne, okay uh, yes thank you very much i'm very pleased to have uh, this forum open today uh, we are pretty much impressed about uh, the the interest and we are very thankful about all the contributors here you are very important for our research Yes, let's move on. First slide. Second slide. <laughs> Facts about agricultural plastics. So agricultural plastic has become, uh, became an important asset in uh, European farming. Uh, they are used uh, for many different uh, scopes. Uh, an important way of using them is through protective cultivation system. This include mulching films, tunnel, micro irrigation system. So all uh, practices that uh, require the use of plastic directly on the field. There is also quite innovative use like I see them uh, micro encapsulation where you have uh, uh, plastic coating seeds or a capsule that uh, have a slow release of uh, agrochemicals. This kind of application results in an intentional release of plastic in soil that can be both uh, conventional, uh, polyolefin based or uh, biodegradable plastic. Uh, it is estimated, these are data from uh, about 10 years ago through a methodology, collected through a methodology that uh, uh, allow uh, uh, using all available data from different source of information uh, that cross validate each other. Actually developing an inventory of agricultural plastic is quite complex. Uh, so there is about three to four million tons of plastic in use estimated uh, that produce about one million tons of waste per year. Uh, a large fraction of that, and that has been also confirmed uh, by the report that the commission uh, sponsorized that was launched yesterday. A lot of this waste is mulching film or equivalent uh, material using protective cultivation system. Uh, Agricultural plastic include both degradable and non-degradable plastic, while the bioplastic and biodegradable plastic are uh, taking a small share of the market. Next slide, please. 
okay, what do we believe? Uh, we are a group of scientists and we believe that uh, plastic culture has provided benefit for farmers in Europe and food production. Those benefits are acting at the short term. So uh, it enables cultivating soil with crops that could not be cultivated uh, different way in a given area, boost production, make production more reliable. It can also uh, enable a reduction of use of pesticides, fertilizer, water, and energy. However, we believe that plastic culture can cause soil pollution. There are robust evidences. Also, visually, uh, you, you can experience directly with your eyes that soil that are treated with agricultural plastic and uh, probably mismanaging agricultural plastic can result in soil pollution. As such, uh, policies and practices that are designed today must take into consideration the long-term holistic sustainability assessment, including the assessment of uh, ecological impacts and the impacts on the ability of soil to dispense uh, ecological and agricultural services. We want to deliver to the next generation soils that are equivalent or even better suit for production than the one we are leaving. We want to deliver this to the next generation. Next slide, please. Um, soil is not a, is not a renewable resource. Uh, plastic pollution in soil is poorly, if not reversible. We do not know what is the level. So the plastic will accumulate. Continuous inputs of plastic in soil will result in constantly increasing uh, level of contamination. And we do not know what is the threshold. We call it a resilience threshold. So the threshold at which the level of contamination of soil beyond which soil will shift to a different state possibly undesirable with the lower productivity, for example. Next slide. So the use uh, or management of the plastic, agricultural plastic, result in fragmentation of plastic and down even to the micro and nano scale. So many of you are familiar with the problem of microplastic. These are debris that are smaller than uh, five millimeters, and then we have the nanoplastics that are defined as, uh, as fragments that are smaller than 100 nanometers. So this is uh, even smaller than bacteria. We are close to the size of a virus, of a large virus like Corona, for example. So there are a lot of open questions about this type of pollution. What are the sources of micro nanoplastic from soil deriving from the use of agricultural plastic? What are, of course, the impacts on ecosystem? What are, are their impacts on physical soil properties as well? For example, can accumulation of plastic alter hydraulic properties? Imagine a soil that has a different uh, hydraulic property, a water flow in soil in a different way that will have indirect consequences on the functioning of the soil ecosystem and on its productivity. Uh, is there an impact on plants growth and quality? Uh, what about the chemical additives? Uh, we have big focus now on the plastic pollution, but plastic comes with a large number of different chemicals that are added to enhance certain properties. Uh, those are also uh, substances that are aliens to the natural environment. Uh, also, we need to link this problem of soil pollution with a broader ecological context. Uh, we know that there are many European level strategies to protect water environment and marine environment. We have robust evidence that plastic pollution in soil can be efficiently transferred to water ecosystems. So we should keep in mind also this element. Uh, we cannot protect one part of the ecosystem forgetting the consequences on other part of the ecosystem. Next slide, please. So I go quickly through this because uh, we had a great presentation from the previous speaker about the social, societal and policy demands. Uh, this study we are supporting with uh, providing scientific knowledge, several strategic documents, starting from the soil health strategy, 
but we are touching upon the green deal, many elements of the green deal and the zero pollution ambition as well. Next slide. So Papillons has been uh, one of the two projects funded under uh, uh, this school to look at the ecological impact of agricultural plastic. We receive a grant of 7 million euro. Our consortium uh, includes 20 partners across Europe and one Chinese partner. Uh, we have a pan-European approach, as you can see, we are well distributed and we will look at uh, sources of pollution and impact of this pollution across different biomes in Europe and agricultural landscape. Next slide, please. Our work is divided in several research missions, and I go through the principal one. So the first uh, research mission is about uh, consolidating the European inventory of agricultural plastic uses, waste management, and potential micro nanoplastic sources. This will add to the nice work that has been conducted and supported by the DG Environment with a report uh, released yesterday. They give some uh, initial background. We will consolidate this by cross-checking information directly with the national stakeholders, but also, uh, in, for example, retailers, farmers, of course, retailers, importers, waste managers. By using this methodology that has been developed by one of our partners 10 years ago, we will be able to cross-validate this information. And the ambition is to create a pan-European atlas of agricultural plastic use. We also have the ambition to link these inventories to uh, sort of a potential uh, of invent to inventories of potential releases of plastic pollution. And we will do that by looking at the uh, technical and chemical characterization of agricultural plastic and look how this, this material uh, tend to break down in different environments. So we really hope that in the next four years, we will come up with the uh, substantial addition to the current knowledge that is still very fragmented. Next slide, please. Another research mission is about uh, conducting European spatial surveys to define, to, to shed some light on the current level of European agricultural soil contamination by micro and nanoplastic. And we design a monitoring network across all Europe where we'll sample and analyze about 100 uh, soils, uh, soils that uh, we know about uh, also the historical use of agricultural plastic or other type of agricultural practices. Uh, we will look at the contamination profile. We will also try to correlate the contamination profile with changes in biodiversity uh, by looking, for example, at the community of soil invertebrates and the microbial diversity to try to identify possible already ongoing impacts. Next slide. The fourth research mission is focusing instead of uh, an experimental um, assessment that will be conducted in field. So I want to just remark that we are using a multi-branch approach. So we go from spatial survey monitoring to different level of experimental assessment. Uh, this one is the most holistic one. It will be conducted in field, in, in experimental agricultural farms, where we will add uh, microplastic to look at the mid and long-term effect by following the evolution of those soil and their property and biodiversity over two years. So we've selected these sites in Southern, Central and Northern Europe. We will conduct this experiment as a, a multifactorial experimental design where we can manipulate some elements. Uh, we will use the natural context locally present in each site, but we will manipulate by adding different level of two typology of plastic one commonly used uh, mulching film based on polyethylene after we grind it to create artificially create a micro and nanoplastic and also uh, a biodegradable PBAT mulching film also aged and grounded to simulate uh, what we expect to, 
to see the type of contamination we expect to see in a natural context. We can also play with the different levels of contamination. For example, we will simulate, uh, we will have control, of course, but we will simulate present day contamination. And we'll also look at what are the expected effects over a long term increased contamination. So with the much higher level than present day. We know from other parts of the world that plastic pollution in soil from the use of agricultural plastic can be can reach tremendous level. There are reports from China where there are a platinum layer of soil that can contain over 10% of plastic. So uh, if we keep using or mismanaging agricultural plastic, those kind of extreme pollution cases are possible. We, we want to know what happened in the case, and we, of course, we want to avoid to reach this level in Europe. Uh, response variable include uh, movement and transport of agricultural plastic, their fragmentation, effects on soil invertebrate, effect on, effects on microbial community, soil property, the ability of soil of exchanging gases with the atmosphere, and of course, effect on crop and plant growth. Next slide, please. Following our multi pronged approach, the next level is to conduct similar type of experiment in a uh, more controlled environment. So we will assess this facility in Amsterdam that enable uh, setting up a mesocosm with soil, including soil fauna and crop, and uh, add the microplastic in a controlled way, uh, design the similar ways we did in the field, but in a control system, uh, factorial experiments. And where we could, uh, after removing the geographical component, we could actually artificially manipulate certain parameters. For example, we believe that the water in the amount of water has an, inf an important impact on the fate and transport of plastic. So for example, here we will manipulate this. We will also, we can also conduct studies by adding or removing the soil fauna to see what happened to the soil and to the transport of plastic. So this mesocondrial experiment will enable a more mechanistic, less environmental realistic, but, but more mechanistic understanding of the ecological implication of plastic pollution in soil. Next slide. Um, similarly, what we did with the mesocos, we will also conduct a very innovative kind of study, again, in laboratory. We are able to produce uh, radio labeled micro and nanoplastic that can be added in a protected environment, can be added in a, on a soil core. This uh, radio tracking technique facilitates enormously the possibility of, of measuring or observing how plastic move and how efficiently they can be incorporated in soil fauna or even in the, in the crop, in the plants. So um, this will be the first time such an experiment will be conducted and will provide very useful information on how uh, the um, plastic can interact with biota in soil. We also, I forgot to say in the previous slide, we, are also, we also have a focus on chemical additives. So we will, conduct, we will look at the movement of chemical additives present in plastic, in agricultural plastic, uh, in a similar way as we look at the movement of the plastic itself, because we believe that the two aspects should be considered together, although there is a frame, policy frames for the chemical additive under reach, uh, but uh, we believe that the standard, for example, in the case of a degradable plastic, the, the, the criteria, quality criteria, including the standard, are not sufficiently clear with regard to the chemical or, su or sufficiently restrictive with regard to the chemical additive aspect. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, and we have also focusing on more detailed laboratory scale experiment with single species soil invertebrate. Uh, where we tested uh, different typology of agricultural of micro nanoplastic derived from agricultural plastic. This again include always biodegradable and non-degradable plastic. And we look at endpoints such as survival, reproduction, energy allocation, growth, behavior. This will give us even a more direct uh, species specific 
assessment of the ecological impacts. And we will cross this information with a more holistic assessment from the mesocos and the field study to generate a, a more general and aggregated vision of, of the ecosystem impact. Uh, we will do this with soil fauna, but also with plants, looking at the germination, plant cell responses, plant performance, biomarker, etc. Next slide, please. Uh, we are also interested, as I mentioned earlier, uh, in the fate of uh, further fate, how, how micro and nanoplastic pollution in agricultural soil can be transported to other parts of the ecosystem. In our project, we put a particular emphasis on the water-driven transport. We believe this is to be an important pathway uh, to link terrestrial and marine pollution and aquatic pollution. To do that, we will use this artificial stream where we can uh, simulate different uh, uh, flow regimes uh, with the water transport, and we will measure how plastic are transported. This includes also work with degradable plastic. We know that there is a concern about the degradability of uh, degradable plastic in different, for example, degradable mulching tin in different environments. So we will study that across our uh, different region uh, through the field plot experiment in the South Center and Northern Europe. But we will also look how uh, those residuals, biodegradable plastic that are transported to the water ecosystem will degrade once they are in the water ecosystem. Um, this is not included in current uh, standards for biodegradable mulching. And we believe, actually, this is confirmed from what we heard from the presentation from Silvia Forne before, it's uh, one area where we need uh, more knowledge to feed into the regulation and policy and the further development of quality standards. Next slide, please. Sorry, Luca, could you wrap it up just a tiny bit? Yes, um, this is the end. Uh, the project is run under the multi-actor approach. That's why you are here today. And uh, we need uh, to have uh, this stakeholder forum on both to listen to our findings, but also to provide feedbacks to us. That's, uh, to do that, we have created a range of working group. Can you give the next slide, please? This working group include uh, work with, we call them farm synergy, industry synergies, policy synergies. Each of these working group enable us to fill up, to, 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 to complete one puzzle of this big project. So farmers will help us to consolidate uh, uh, inventories of agricultural plastic, will give us access to their soil to, to, to be analyzed for their pollution. We hope to uh, develop a very tight interaction with the industry, uh, again, to get information on the use and the production of agricultural plastic, but also on their technical and physical characteristics, their uh, to share their information about the post-use management. And finally, of course, policy synergy. We are in deep dialogue with the key DGs, and we are hoping to develop also uh, some uh, interaction with the ECA and EFSA concerning their uh, stake, their interest into this project. We will hear from them later. Next slide. I just want to conclude. Uh, I, again, I'm very thankful. I hope I gave you the idea that this is a multi-pronged assessment. We want to develop a holistic vision over the problem. And I think that this is the demand that has been expressed in the previous talk. We, we want to, to fill the gap, the knowledge gap currently existing on the impacts of microplastic in soil and having a look at the long-term sustainability. So feel free to engage with us. We will certainly keep the dialogue with you directly and as part of this forum. Jointly with our sister projects, Minagres, that will be presented now by Violet Gessen, uh, we, are, we will work together with this uh, multi-stakeholder uh, platform. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Luca. And now, without further ado, I would like to call Professor Dr. Violet Gessen, whose name I hope I pronounced correctly to give her speech on the Minagris project. Thank you very much.
Thanks, uh, thanks for the invitation. Maybe uh, I could share my screen. I would pre prefer this if it's possible. Or not? Anne? Yep, yes, it's uh, possible you can share now. I just had to stop sharing my screen. So, um, okay. Um, the thing is that when I heard about Papillon, can you see the, the slides from my side? Yes. Um, okay. Yes. Just not in full screen mode. So, like this, better. Okay. okay. Thanks for the invitation to participate in this uh, stakeholder meeting because when I heard, first of all, of Papillon, which is a sister or twin project of Minagris, which was accepted by the European Commission. On this call, we were surprised how similar these projects are. And we take advantage of this because with 40 scientists in whole Europe working on a similar topic, we are stronger than only working 20 or 25 um, institutions on one topic. So as well as uh, Papillon, we will look on the sources, environmental fates and impact on ecosystem services and overall sustainability. We are 20 partners from 12 member state countries. We have 11 case study sites across six biogeographical regions. And as well as Papillon was describing, we have a multi-actor approach and we were very happy to be invited here to this meeting because our plan is to make a common multi-actor group, common stakeholder group, um, to make a really strong uh, stakeholder group to really develop sustainable plastic use and as well give together advice to policymakers with what which aspects should be addressed and what is important. So what we are doing as well as Papillon, we will assess the plastic contamination linked with different agricultural activities. And there, as uh, Luca already explained, based on intentional and unintentional plastic use. And it's, it, it sounds very easy, look on this plastic in agriculture, but we know we have a lot of different <laughs> uh, polymers which are in actual use, as well for biodegradable plastics. But as well, we have a lot of additives which are used for this biodegradable plastic and as well for conventional plastic. So what we are trying to find out is what do farmers use? What do the retailers sell? But we need you from the industrial partners to tell us what are the additives in these polymers? Because we cannot test any effect of any contamination if we only know which is a polymer. And we will find different polymers in the fields and we can, we can spend months and months to try to find out which additives are in these, added to these polymers. But we could as well take the advantage of these projects and really see what is the effects of these polymers, including additives. So what we are asking the industry to really collaborate with us, to give us the information we require to come to, come to a real assessment of what do we find in our soils after plastic use or in unintentional plastic use? And what is the situation? What are the polymers we find in soil, but what as well are the additives? And as well, what we are going to test as well is what are the pesticides uh, absorbed to these uh, plastics? We will study the effects and contamination in controlled soils, mesocosm, and lab experiments. As well as Papillon, we will test the effects on soil physical properties, on soil organisms, and we will have a look on the synergies with other soil contaminants. What we would like to avoid, and there we think we have a very important task here, to avoid to come to the same situation as we are facing now in Europe on, on pesticides in soil. After 60 years of pesticide applications, we face that nearly all soils in Europe are contaminated with mixtures of pesticides. So the plastic is now starting to replace partly herbicides and will uh, work on replacing other pesticides. But what is the real effect? 
And I would really appreciate if we, in this case, could think in a precautionary principle, that means to avoid to contaminate soils, what we already see in many places of the world, and then say, okay, oh, there is no mean of remediation, what shall we do now? Please take these as policymakers into consideration that we first of all should really prove that the plastics which are used in agriculture do not lead to contamination in soil, but as well do not have any synergistic effects with the, with the pesticides and veterinary drugs. We know they're already present in soil and then uh, make a very strong degree decrease in soil health. As well, what we are going to do is that we will look at the debris transport. And then we made first studies that it is uh, the microplastics from all different polymers are strongly transported with wind erosion. And then uh, underlay an aerial transport and maybe deposited many, many kilometers or dozens of kilometers away from the place where they are created. So please be aware of this, that we have as well the transport with the wind and as well as the risk for people to inhalate these microplastics directly then with unknown human health effects. And as well, we will look uh, with our colleagues on the uh, transport along the food chain, what will be accumulated in plants and what, are, what are we are going to eat. I tell you that we are really in the beginning for the terrestrial ecosystem and as well methods to really technologies to really uh, detect and identify the real amounts of microplastics in the terrestrial ecosystem is a challenge. So we are happy to work together with this on Pap with Papillon to re really take the top European research institutes who are developing these technologies together to come with a harmonized technology in Europe. What we now can say, what we find with our actual technologies, which we have available, which are not harmonized on Europe, we found 50, 60 uh, particles per gram soil in, in average in European soils. It is based on the first um, study we did with the Joint Research Center. Imagine the number, yeah, that is 50,000 particles per kilogram. They're already there with unknown effects. With unknown, we don't know which, which uh, additives they have, which pesticide they have. We don't know, we only know the polymers. There is a lot of biodegradable plastics under them. And we would like to um, evaluate the effects of plastic use, the positive if effects, as well as uh, water, uh, improving water household and something like this, and the negative effects on a longer term on farm level. And therefore we have colleagues who will work on the socioeconomic indicators. And we as well will develop a decision tool for farmers to find sustainable solution. Is the application of bio biodegradable plastic really a sustainable solution? Or will you have a long-term contamination of microplastics of your soils, which in the long term will de uh, decrease the soil health and the quality of your soil and the soil functions? So we, we would like, uh, we have um, made a stakeholder train uh, yeah. done by Charlotte and she, uh, I really like this idea of this train. We would like to go with all stakeholders together from governments, input supply, production, pressures, uh, processing and retailers, consumers together to find the possibility of sustainable use of plastic in agriculture. And please, for the policymakers, take the precautionary principle there into the consideration because we cannot remediate the soils which are polluted by, by microplastics. There is no way to do it now, and I doubt that we will find a way in future. If you would like to know more, of, if you would like to join the network, from you could uh, contact Shuli Papillon, but as well our coordination team. And here you can see our websites. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Ms. Heysen, for outlining your research objectives. And as we can see, there are plenty of research questions still. So now I would like to give the floor to Mr. Angelo Innamorati, 
who works on bioplastics as well, and uh, in DJ Agri regarding the circular economy, bioeconomy, and bioplastics to give some of his reflection, please. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Uh, I, in fact, uh, I, my, my intervention is uh, focused on the uh, useful uh, of uh, biodegradable, biodegradable plastics and the problems occasioned by the conventional plastics. Uh, and I'm referring especially in this case on the uh, mulch films. Uh, I would like to, to observe uh, firstly that uh, uh, in, this, in this work you are developing, it is necessary to uh, avoid to the, uh, disregard the problem uh, of the presence of microplastics in sewage sludge. Uh, sewage sludge uh, is, uh, is uh, a container, in fact, unfortunately, of uh, microplastics of, uh, coming from the, the discharge of the, the urban wastewater of the towns. And uh, this, this material is, uh, um, is used as a fertilizer or improver in the uh, European soils. Uh, the DG environment is uh, reviewing the, uh, the uh, assessing and to review the, the legislation, but uh, it is necessary to take into account that this this material is largely used in the Europe uh, in uh, on the European soils, and of course is polluting with the presence not only of uh, microplastic but also uh, pharmaceutical cosmetics. Um, uh, other pollu pollutants like the PAH uh, and the PIS. Now, uh, coming to the, uh, the, um, the, the use of uh, biodegradable plastics, uh, Italy, is, uh, Italy and Spain uh, are the, a great um, important user of this uh, uh, for mulch film of uh, biodegradable plastics. And uh, uh, there, there is, exists also uh, an, an, a standard, a SEN standard developed in 2018, the uh, EN uh, 17033, developed by uh, research and experts that are, um, are, have uh, indicated how to use, in which condition to use uh, the uh, biodegrad biodegradable plastic and the, the characteristics to avoid pollution uh, and the toxic effect on the uh, micro, uh, microfauna uh, in, uh, in the soil. This standard indicates that uh, the, 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 the condition of use of uh, uh, mulch film for biodegradable plastics is uh, at least 18 uh, degrees in the soil uh, with a, a, a time of biodegradation of uh, 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 maximum 24 months. I've seen the, and this is the same observation I made yesterday to uh, Luca Nizzetto, that the, the, the investigation is made also in Finland. But in Finland, I, I, I'm not aware of the use of, of mulch films because there, is, there are no, no conditions to use this mulch film, uh, biodegradable mulch film in Finland. We, are, uh, we have information that uh, the, this much film, uh, biodegradable much film, are also used uh, in Germany, but in fact, the bulk of this uh, uh, use is, is in the southern of uh, Europe. So, in my opinion, the attention should be concentrated in, the, uh, in uh, this area where the, the much film is used. Uh, as regards the, the the statistics, uh, uh, we have uh, information that uh, in this moment, the biodegradable uh, plastic are used are 
uh, for mulch film are around 4% of the total mulch film used in agriculture. In fact, uh, 75,000 uh, tons of, uh, of uh, mulch film are conventional. And uh, uh, I think it was, yes, 3,000 tons are uh, biodegradable mulch films. So uh, I invite you to take contact uh, uh, in developing this, uh, this work with the uh, specialists that have developed the SEN standard, EN17033, uh, among which there is also the professor uh, Dimitris uh, Briasoulis and the, the institution, uh, Flander Institution, the Flander Institution uh, um, owes, where that have worked intensively with other collaborators uh, on, on this uh, on this item. Um, so uh, this work, of course, are focused on the uh, to avoid the uh, plastic pollution of soils. This is very good, um, and uh, I wish you good work. Uh, but also knowing that. Um, as regards the transport by water of plastics, we have a, a study carried out, but uh, not by uh, farmers organization or the industry, but the, from Lega Ambiente, that is uh, an environment or an uh, NGO, that on the uh, beaches, Italian beaches, the uh, waste detected and this, this work was uh, published in uh, the beginning uh, 2021, are 90%, 90% of conventional plastics. The remaining are uh, wood, uh, metal, etc. And uh, in the 1% of other uh, uh, waste, there is, there is a 0.3% of uh, biodegradable plastic. So, what I would like to say to you that this material is a very interesting for agriculture, biodegradable plastics for mulch films in this case. And uh, we don't see there is a problem for uh, um, degradation in the water because uh, it is not arriving to the water. So in the sea, we don't have proof about that. On the contrary, we have proof that there are a, a great quantity of conventional plastics. So uh, as a DG Agri, we are, uh, uh, we are uh, in favor to the, the use of this, uh, future use of these uh, uh, mulch films uh, uh, with the, uh, of, uh, by, the, by degradable. Uh, this is by economy, uh, very interesting for the future. And uh, we will wait for the result of uh, your work. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much for touching upon all these various issues that I'm sure we will dig deeper on. Um, now we will move on to our second panel of interventions. And first of all, we will show a video from Mr. Bernard Lemont, who is uh, from Agricultural Plastics Europe. AP Europe is a professional association bringing together companies and organizations involved in agri-plastic. And their focus is that at the end of the decade, the target will be to collect and recycle around 70% of used agricultural plastics all across Europe. Uh, to further express, here is Mr. Bernard Lemont himself in a video first, please. Good morning, everyone. And thank you to be with us this morning. AP Europe, welcome the Anomia report on conventional and biodegradable plastic. This report is completing the collection and sorting intrepid potential report from the agriculture working group of the Circular Plastic Alliance. With this report, the Commission is sharing with us the state of play of non-packaging agri-plastic and biodegradable products in Europe in most aspects of their end-of-life management. Plastic is an ally for the agricultural production. It provides numerous services to farmers and agriculture. With a modest investment, the farmer improves his income 
with a higher heel in quantity and quality while reducing consumption of chemical pesticide and fertilizer, water and energy, among other multiple advantages. To fit the growing mankind, looking for an alimentary independence, countries will increase the use of plastic for agriculture in the future. Precision farming, organic farming, agroecology cannot be achieved without plastic. Agroplastic is a small market. 722,000 tons of plastic are marketed today in Europe, generating 1,175,000 tons of waste, including solid content, mainly mineral, organic, and water. Therefore, agri-plastic waste are not dangerous and not contaminated by chemicals. The National Collections Scheme, so called NCS, aware of the necessity to reduce the negative environmental impact, the plasticity community is already involved in numerous existing collection schemes, voluntary or mandatory, with remarkable results, as it is in Ireland, Sweden, Norway, France, Germany, UK. Several other national collection schemes are being launched or in project. Spain, Poland, Belgium, Italy, Switzerland, Austria, bringing technical and financial solutions to farmers. In each of them, within the extended producer responsibilities framework, farmers, distributors, and industry have been associated in the governance, ensuring the best efficiency and result, applying a full bottom-up approach and the cost internalization. As of today, we consider that 80% of the market volume in Europe from 11 countries is covered by such national initiative with a reliable monitoring. If collection still occur in other countries, the absence of national organization provides little information on results and efficiency. With a lack of relevant and sustainable end of life management, negative externalities may appear with bad practices, risk of accumulation in soil, microplastic, and marine litter. Development of national collection in existing national scheme and the implementation of new ones all over Europe is the first action to tackle the plastic pollution and reduce those negative externalities. After the collection and sorting, the second axis for pertinent action is a waste reduction at source. R&D project as Rafu in France and product design as underlined by the Yonomina report provide already several possibilities. The plasticity communities has accumulated a very large experience on the matter with the developing of new practices, techniques, process and machinery. Favorable condition to ease the transfer of technology and knowledge between countries must be promoted, ensuring an acceleration in the implementation of solutions. With no doubt, biodegradable products are part of the waste reduction at source. Biodegradability is the ability of a material to be first degraded and then bioassimilated by microorganisms in the environment without residual ecotoxicity controlled by EC standards. Since its appearance 20 years ago, characteristics have been constantly improved, enlarging possibilities of application and ensuring agronomic results equivalent to conventional ones. The recent study, Biolon, on the use of biodegradable mulching, published last September by the French Committee for Plastic in Agriculture, appointed by the Ministry of Overseas Department, has been realized by a consortium of users, local and metropolitan research center, and supported by the industry. When we consider the entire value chain, including removal, collection, and recycling, the Biodog report demonstrates an agronomic, technical, and cost efficiency equivalent to the conventional plastic. 500 tons of biodegradable mulching save 2,000 tons of waste. Local public authorities have no clear vision of what can be done to accompany growers 
is the change of practices using biodegradable mulching as an alternative when recycling is more and more expensive and when filling less and less acceptable. If collection is increased, there is a need for recycling. It is not the smallest challenge today. With significant and regular volume of homogeneous polymer of a rather good quality, agri-plastic waste have been always appreciated by recyclers. It is a resource. Waiting for better availability of chemical recycling and energy recovery, mechanical recycling in the meantime is strategic for the sector. However, the Chinese world has limited European recycling capacities for agri-plastic. The collection and sorting untapped potential report from the Circular Plastic Alliance stated that Europe lacked 550,000 tons of recycling capacity for agri-plastic. This is the equivalent of 260,000 tons of polymer available for integration wasted. The report estimates there is a need between 25 to 30 additional recycling lines representing a minimum of 250 new employment. The waste quality improvement is a prerequisite to waste recycling and obtain high quality PCR and facilitate incorporation into a new product. The search of quality must be, must be found at all steps of the end of life process from the farm to the integration, including collection, pretreatment and recycling. Innovative recycling technologies are now available on the market and should be widely spread all over Europe. Transport is also a key issue. I said before, agri-plastic waste are not contaminated by chemicals. Since recycling capacity are not based on, on area of conception, transport across border within Europe is obligatory. The amendment of the Basel Convention guideline did not consider the reality of the non-contamination of agri-plastic. It is therefore necessary to underline that specificity in the draft of the waste shipment directive. Evolution and standard. With the incorporation of collection, recycling and integration concerns is also an opportunity to mobilize and raise awareness of the entire sector. The extended producer responsibility is the adaptive legal frame for implementation of new NCS. For such a small market, a specific directive on plastic or agricultural seems disproportionate. The Commission must be confident on the commitment of farmers and the industry to manage the end of life of agroplastic. Any coercive legislation with banning measures or heavy taxes will jeopardize the production. However, to accelerate and consolidate implementation of collection scheme in any, any new regulation should consider the extended producer responsibility with a shared governance between economic actors, farmers, distributors, and producers. The Agricultural Working Group of the Circular Plastic Economy Alliance has identified and reported a major dockyard in product design, collection, and sorting. R&D and integration. Following this work, the CPA could be the good instance for collaborative projects integrating national collection scheme development, additional recycling capacities, R&D program, standard evolution, and accompaniment of biodegradable product, among others. Zero plastic on field, 100% recycled, is the objective for all of us. The plastic industry is ready to commit in a five-year program at the European level, supporting as well such equivalent program at member state level. Our contribution is presented in the European Plastic Industry Strategy document available for all member states willing to tackle plastic pollution in agriculture. Dealing with different responsibility for 25 years in plastic in agriculture, I have, been, I have seen the change in the plastic industry sector. The time is over now where designing, production, and sale were sufficient. Today, market supplier must consider the agri-plastic integrated management to fulfill farmers, growers, and the environment expectation 
for full sustainability and circularity. Let's do it in a collaborative way with all stakeholders and the public authorities. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this video from AP Europe. This has been uh, the vision of the Agriplastic Organization on how plastic can be an ally for the agricultural production. And we have Mr. Lemoine with us and Mr. Xavier Ferry as well from the organization who has been answering questions as well in the chat. So thank you for that. But we have to give now the floor to Mr. Angelo Maggiore, who has to leave soon. So I would like to call him to the floor if possible from the Food Safety Authority of EFSA. And he's going to talk about the micro and nanoplastics in food, EFSA's activities. Thank you very much. Good morning, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for inviting me this morning. It's a pleasure for me to stay with you today. Uh, are you going to share the presentation or do I need to do it myself? I understand that you are going to, to upload. I can do it on behalf of you. Yeah, okay, good. So I uh, I work I see, okay I work in the scientific committee and uh, emerging risks unit of the European Food Safety Authority. Uh, next one, please. So I'm going to describe very briefly uh, what the European Food Safety Authority has done so far in the context of. Uh, micro and nanoplastics uh, in for food safety. So now we are uh, taking another perspective to the subject, which is the impact on uh, food safety. And uh, at the origin of the uh, when when EPSA started to 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 deal with the problem, the perspective was the emerging risks perspective, and that I'm going to tell you a little bit. Uh, afterwards, we have decided to, uh, to provide a statement, or better, the CONTAM panel has provided a statement. And then I'm going to uh, describe a little bit about an event we have had uh, in May uh, this year, which is called the EFSA Colloquium. So I'm going to go very quickly across this, these three items. Next one, please. First of all, when we talk about as I said at the beginning, we started to look at micro and nanoplastics in the context of the emerging risks identification process. So it's good maybe that I provide a brief description of what we mean by uh, emerging risks. By that, we mean either a new hazard, but not necessarily a new hazard. We also mean a known hazard to which we are observing or reporting an increase in exposure. That's what we mean by emerging issue. But we don't need to go to the level of specific new, uh, new hazards. We also can stay at a higher level, at the level of what we call drivers, drivers which are those uh, natural or anthropogenic uh, factor that can drive the emergence of, of a risk. And they are usually very much interacting with each other. Circular economy is one of these uh, drivers, and uh, we have heard about it in the previous presentations. And it's a problem that it's an issue that we are also tackling within the EFSA's activities. It's a tool that we have in place, the emerging risks identification process, for preparing to future challenges for risk assessment and for, um, for food safety. Next one, please. So this is the very start of the story. In 2013, we, had, we started to discuss about micro and nanoplastics in the context of the emerging risks identification, emerging risk exchange network, which is one of the two emerging risks network we have established at the, at the EFSA. And at the origin, the discussion was very much focused on impact on marine environment. Uh, at the beginning, it was considered more as an environmental issue. But at that time, we started to wonder, uh, do we, could we also have an impact for food safety? But the problem is that because of lack of data, at that time, no decision could, could be taken in relation to uh, food safety risks. And the recommendation, therefore, was that EFSA 
should monitor the issue, possibly consult other bodies and collect information. Two years afterward, the BFR asked us to, to, uh, to draft a scientific statement or an opinion on the presence of plastic microplast uh, particles and nanoparticles in food with particular focus on seafood. Next one, please. So that was at the origin of the of a statement produced by one of the EFSA panel, the, uh, the panel of con on contaminants. And here I've tried to summarize the main point, which is in relation to the two aspects of risk assessment, so exposure and hazard assessment. In relation to the exposure, the occurrence of microplastics has been observed mainly in, uh, uh, reported in seafood mainly, but not only seafood, fish, shrimp, and bivalve, in particular in relation to the digestive tract of these marine organisms, but not only seafood, also in honey, beer, and table salt. A tentative exposure scenario was de developed, very simplified, based on the assumption uh, of a consumption of 225 grams of uh, mussels, and uh, the, the outcome of this preliminary uh, estimation was that an average portion of muscle, so 225 grams, could contain about seven micrograms of plastics. That's in terms of occurrence, so the exposure side. In terms of effects, we know that over 90% of ingested micro and uh, nanoplastics are excreted, and then the effects depend very much on the dimension of the particles. So if it's more than 100, the diameter is more than 150 micron, then it's likely not to be absorbed, but could cause local effects on an immune system and gut inflammation. If it's less than 150 micron, then the particle could indeed translocate across the gut epithelium, causing systemic exposure. Bigger problems if it's uh, if the particle is uh, smaller, uh, smaller in particular than 1.5 micron, and in that case it could indeed penetrate organs. Next one, please. So, in summary, the recommendations provided in this statement was that first of all, analytical method should be further developed and standardized for microplastics and completely developed for nanoplastics. That's why I've included further between brackets. And quality assurance should be demonstrated. We are observing a very, very variable quality of the studies. We need to generate occurrence data, not only for marine organisms, but also for terrestrial ones. We need to uh, to, to, to research the toxicokinetic and the toxicity including studies of what happens uh, in the gastrointestinal tract of uh, human bodies. We need, therefore, to a good quality exposure data and data to identify adverse effects, modes of actions, and those response relationship. Without this kind of data, it's impossible to perform a comprehensive uh, risk assessment for human health. Next one, please. Next, next one, please. Yeah, thank you. So here we go to the colloquium. It's an event that we have held uh, last May. And the idea was really to bring together different players, researchers, risk assessors, risk managers, industry, but also social scientists and risk communicators. That's an, an, important, an important point. And uh, in spite of the progress that has been done uh, with respect to the uh, to the amount to the data described in the 2016 in the uh, statement of the contempt panel the evidence is growing but still is not enough to, uh, to to perform a comprehensive risk assessment as i said before the quality is very much variable so that's an important point we should insist 
then we can say that the problem has a clear global nature. And that means that international collaboration is required and engagement with a wide range of stakeholders, including consumers and citizens. We need to identify the challenges and the regulatory constraints for embedding, including life cycle assessments in the risk assessment we perform. So food system as well assessment in the, in the, in the risk assessment of micro and nanoplastics. And then a final point that was the conclusion of this, uh, of this event, of this colloquium, is that a transparent communication needs to be ensured to provide stakeholders and citizens with a, with a clear description of what we know about effects on human health of micro and nanoplastics and what we need to do in the future in order to be able to uh, perform a risk assessment. And uh, it's important to, to address uh, risk perceptions. So in particular, to understand the social, maybe also psychological mechanisms according to which citizens' perception of the risk is quite high in spite of the lack of uh, evidence on health effects. That's something that we need to, uh, we need to address. And of course, we need to consider stakeholders' priority when setting uh, the, the focus of our risk assessment. So that was the conclusion of the, uh, of the workshop. So it's, I'm very, very pleased to be here with you, especially if, uh, if we see the emergence of uh, possible risks for, for, for food and maybe also for feed safety, which is a problem an, or an issue that has been largely uh, unexplored so far, and the connection with environmental aspects. Thank you very much, and uh, I'm very happy to be connected with you in the future and to respond to eventual questions you might have. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much to Mr. Maggiore for underlining the presence of MNP in food and the activities of EFSA in general. We are running a bit late, so I would like to ask now the speakers to represent their time. And I fortunately I have to do the ungrateful job of cutting them after 10 minutes. But now we would like to call Mr. Christoph Reinberger to the floor to give his presentation on the other agency, ECHA, which is the European Chemicals Agency. Mr. Reinberger, the floor is yours, please. Yes, thank you, Mr. Zoldrati. Um, can you go to the next slide, please? Yes, so I'm going to present uh, a little bit of a summary of our inquiries into intentional added uh, microplastic uses in agriculture. And first I should uh, put the, the usual disclaimer that the views are uh, my professional opinions and are not necessarily any kind of policy views uh, of the agency. You know that there is an ongoing um, work within the European Commission on the REACH restriction proposal that the agency has fabricated on request of the European Commission. So in 2018, the European Commission, as part of their plastics strategy, tasked the agency to look into intentional uses of microplastics. And we have done so, and uh, we have come across several uses in agriculture. Next slide, please. And there are probably like four major categories that are um, that came to our attention. Uh, if I start uh, from the top and go then clockwise, so first you see um, fertilizer additives that are used mostly to prevent the caking of fertilizers. Then uh, the next one that you see at three o'clock, no, sorry, not the next slide, but the next, the next bubble that you see at three o'clock, that is um, um, capsule suspension plant protection products that are added uh, in order to release um, targeted amounts of plant protection substances. So the active ag agent is encapsulated in, in a microplastic shell. Then at six o'clock, you see uh, seeded treats that are also encapsulated. And within that encapsulation, the seed 
might uh, be somehow nested um, in also plant protection products, but also fertilizers. So it's almost like a shell around the seed and within that you have these nutrients. And then at nine o'clock you see um, controlled release fertilizers that are really targeted uh, fertilizers which require less amounts of fertilizer and that release the fertilizer um, over time uh, when once applied. So those are intentional uses of microplastic in agriculture. You might also be wondering, well, um, what about sewage sludge? I, I know that this is a big topic among the research community and, and uh, for this project, but they are not necessarily intentionally used, uh, meaning that they are basically the, the residuals of other uses, potentially also of, of uh, intentional uses, but not intentional as products used in agriculture. Next slide, please. So how big a problem are these uses? Um, here is an overview of all the releases that are currently occurring in the union. This is a kind of a summary result of our um, analysis into intentional uses of microplastics. And you see that the fertilizer products amount to uh, roughly uh, 9,000 um, metric tons, uh, 9,000 9, um, metric tons per year. And, and then you have uh, something like 1,000 metric tons for the plant protection products. Um, and uh, together they form maybe a quarter of the environmental releases that we have been calculating. So this is for the whole European Union. Um, maybe I can also point you towards the sewage sludge. So you see that you are muted. Yes, it seems we have lost you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you, sorry. Um, so, so there is this part in the middle, which is the wastewater quantities uh, or the, the quantities of microplastics that go to wastewater and from there to the environment. So that might uh, contain a huge part of the sewage sludge. Uh, okay, next one, please. So coming to the proposed regulatory actions, we foresee or have proposed to the European Commission that there would be a proposed uh, ban on certain of these intentional uses, uh, but that these would enter into force with a staggering plan. So five years transition period for uses in fertilizing products uh, that would be aligned with the new fertilizing product regulation, which also foresees um, some bans on, on microplastics in, in, in fertilizing products that are uh, European-wide labeled and marketed. Then a five-year transition period for other agricultural and horticultural uses, including the seed treatments, and an eight-year transition period for uses in plant protection products and in biocides. We also propose exemptions for biodegradable plastics, um, and they have to meet uh, certain, certain criteria, certain um, tests uh, that are standardized and are relatively strict. So um, there is ongoing discussion at the policy level what kind of tests would really be needed. And again, this has to be aligned with the existing criteria in the, in the fertilizing product regulation. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, here are the next steps. So these are all indicative timelines, but we provided um, our opinion on, on, on uh, this proposal in, in January 2021. Now it is with the Commission and they are uh, preparing a proposal for then the regulatory text and that has to be agreed also with the EU member states. And it's foreseen that this would still happen in 2022. Then the European Parliament and the Council have to agree on the regulatory text so they could have certain, um, certain criticism or uh, wishes for changes but uh, it is hopefully so that the whole restriction would go into force by 2023. And uh, with that, we would basically cut 
at least the amount of intentional um, microplastics that are intentionally used and, and, and directly applied to, to the environment. I hope that was all clear. And um, unfortunately, I have to run now. But if you have questions, uh, you can always contact me via email. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much to Mr. Renberger for yeah. highlighting the intentionally added microplastic in agriculture. And we'll run as well now to Mr. Hasso von Pongra. He is from the European Bioplastics to give his presentation on plastics in agriculture and the position of the EU BP and moreover, what are bioplastics? The floor is yours, Mr. Von Pokal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, would you mind if I could share my own screen because I made one or two small changes to the slides, but it's just very small. Of course, of move. course, please go ahead. I stopped sharing now, so you can just uh, click on the share button. Okay, did it work now? Can you see? Yes. Very good. Okay, um, I'll try to stick to those 10 minutes real quick. Maybe one or two words about our association for those who don't know us. We exist since a bit over uh, 25 years, almost uh, 30 years now. We started a purely German association for only biodegradable plastics and now are one for the entire European market with members from inside and outside of Europe uh, going for bio-based uh, and biodegradable plastics altogether. Here's just an overview of the members we currently have, roughly 70 members covering the entire value change from renewable raw material to green chemistry, manufacturers of bioplastics, distributors, converters, and so on. A word about what are bioplastics. According to our definition, bioplastics are bio-based biodegradable or both. It's very important to keep apart because being bio-based does not mean that you are biodegradable and vice versa. Biodegradable plastics need to be bio-based, at least not completely. Um, that's the one we had there. And uh, one thing to understand what bioplastics are not. So oxidegradable plastics or enzyme-mediated degradable plastics are not bioplastics even if they claim to be biodegradable, they're not. They always fail to uh, prove complete biodegradation, which is absolutely necessary in order to make sense and to be uh, sustainable. Uh, just one or two words about the uh, plastic production market. So as we already said before, earlier this morning by, I think it was uh, Sylvia, for me that uh, the market of bioplastics is less than 1% of the entire uh, plastics production market, but indeed it is a growing market. So within the next five years, we expect a uh, average annual growth of roughly 6.3% and altogether around 36% in those five years. So we indeed expect a uh, growth. Uh, how is it uh, the market uh, divided? As you can see, most or almost half is going into packaging, flexible and rigid packaging, and a growing number in consumer goods and textiles, but also the agriculture and horticulture uh, department is growing. And here you have an overview where the, uh, uh, which of the different polymers are going into the agriculture and horticultural uh, market. And as you can see, it's only the biodegradable polymers going into that market, which makes sense because a bio-based non-biodegradable polymer in the agriculture sector makes little sense because in most cases they are uh, drop-ins for the conventional uh, counterparts and as such, apart from the fact that being made from renewable resources have no different uh, properties distinguishing them from the conventional plastics. Now, bioplastics uh, in the agricultural sector, of course, uh, you can use them in very different kinds of uh, different applications. 
but I will concentrate my next few slides on the uh, mulching films, which, as already heard today, make up for most of the agricultural products, uh, plastic products. And here we say that around 80,000 tons of mulchings are marketed annually, of which roughly 5% are biodegradable. And as you heard already before, most of them are being used more in the southern parts of Europe, France, Spain, and Italy, but also in Germany and the Benelux is going. And it's also said that the plastic films in general uh, uh, generate about 80% of the agricultural plastic waste. And here, the important issue is, can these applications be collected? If so, if they can be collected, then they should be collected. And if they can be recycled, that should also happen. But as we also heard today by Sylvia, obviously the amount of uh, agricultural uh, plastics actually being collected is already rather low and the ones then being recycled is even much lower. And this is where we think uh, that biodegradable uh, plastics in agriculture make sense if the others are not collected and recycled. Uh, Angelo already mentioned earlier today some uh, standards, or one standard, the EN 7033 on biodegradable mulch films. But the other standards for uh, biodegradability and compostability are also important because they actually built the basis for this standard. And you have the one for uh, compostability, the EN 13432 or the EN 14995 for industrial composting. Then you have one for home composting, uh, which is currently being uh, made also as a European standard. Then you have uh, the one for biodegradability in soil, as I said, the EN17033. That is very similar to the uh, other biodegradability standards, but the difference is that you have a prolonged time period for degradation at a lower temperature. So um, the standards in 2012, uh, the EN13655 was revised, and then we have two different ones, one for the non-biodegradable uh, films for uh, mulch films. And here there's a clear recommendation that these mulch films, if they're not biodegradable, should be at least 25 microns thick. And for the ones that are below those 25 micron, they should be according to EN 17033. And uh, those have uh, special requirements and test methods which uh, show that uh, these uh, films can be certified to be biodegradable in soil. And they include very rigorous tests on not only biodegradation, but also ecotoxicity, properties of the films and components and ingredients. So I'm not going into deep into this now, but only for you to understand when you talk about biodegradation of 90%, that is total biodegradation. It doesn't mean that 10% are being left somewhere uh, outside or in the field. It just shows the conversion of the carbon into CO2. However, not all of the carbon is converted into CO2. Between 10 to up to 40% of that carbon is actually uh, digested by the microbes. So these can't even be seen in that uh, conversion rate. So a 90% CO2 conversion rate is absolute and complete biodegradation. And like I said, very extensive tests on ecotoxicity are also part of this EN17033. Now, uh, some advantages of biodegradable mulching films is that they do not to be, need to be collected and they can be plowed under and they show no accumulation, at least not more than maybe one or two cycles because they have uh, two years to actually completely biodegrade in soil, meaning that the maximum amount of plastic accumulating is that after two years. And 
in the meantime, everything that has been plowed under will continue to biodegrade. So there is a maximum uh, accumulation. While on the other hand, when you talk about uh, mulching films from uh, non-biodegradable plastics, these parts that are not collected and recycled, they will accumulate uh, indefinitely and will add on and on. So there's no way that those plastics, once they enter the soil, will be actually re uh, retracted. So it is very important to see that uh, these uh, non biodegradable mulch films need to be uh, thick enough to be actually recovered and collected, and if possible, but that's another uh, topic, recycled afterwards. And here again, just uh, showing what it would look like if you uh, cease cultivation every two years, then using biodegradable mulching films would mean that after two years you would start at zero again because all the uh, particles that had been plowed under will have biodegraded completely, while again for the non-biodegradable ones, they will continue to uh, accumulate in the soil and rendering it completely unusable at some stage in time. So what are the takeaways from this? That non-biodegradable conventional and biodegradable plastic products for agricultural purpose can very well coexist. However, non-biodegradable conventional products must be economically retrievable and actually have to be retrieved. So thereby following the uh, recommendation of EN 13655, non-biodegradable mulch films should be at least 25 micrometers in thickness. Better is if they are uh, thicker than that to be sure that after a year you can still collect them without them uh, ripping apart and having parts of it scattered in the soil. And this is to my mind one very important point, this should become mandatory. Then you often hear that uh, the sustainability of biodegradable plastics need to be assessed, which is perfectly fine, but we think that these potential risks need to be assessed against the risk of non-biodegradable plastics and not against a utopian vision of plastics not having any negative effects at all, because the criteria for proof of sustainability should apply to all plastics and not only to biodegradable ones. And we should also take into consideration that any improvement to the current status should be seriously considered because what we often see is that the quest for the perfect solution often impedes the better one. So looking for biodegradable components in the use for agricultural uh, process is maybe not perfect. And there is still, of course, potential contamination, but it is quite low to nearly non-existent, while the current practices obviously show that the use of non-biodegradable mulch films, if they don't have the minimum thickness, indeed create a gigantic problem with the soil. And therefore, we shouldn't wait for uh, the possibilities of finding uh, biodegradable plastics, which can biodegrade in any kind of environment without leaving any kind of trace, but we should go with what we already have now. Of course, improvement should be done, but we shouldn't stop using them now and instead go for them. Um, that would be all from my side at this point in time. I would like to invite you all to our conference, which will be a hybrid one taking place in Berlin on 30 November and 1st of December. And with that, I'll be finished and I'm happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much to Mr. Campogrel. Questions will come in short time, but before that, Last but not least, we would like to now give the floor to the farmer's perspective to make sure we have an input from their side as well. So I would like to call Ms. Annalisa Sacardo, who is here with us from Coldiretti. She's a policy advisor on sustainable agriculture in the largest farming organization, not just in Italy, but in Europe overall. So please 
Ms. Sakato, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, good morning. Thank you, thank you, you all, and uh, for participating to this um, uh, interesting meeting. Um, my organization is uh, the most important uh, association uh, of farmers uh, in Italy. Uh, so we have a wide uh, uh, point of view uh, about the issue uh, of um, using uh, um, plastic. Uh, agriculture is uh, the sector that most uh, uses plastics uh, due uh, to the use of mulching and containers of pesticides and fertilizers. Currently in agriculture, uh, plastic is used uh, for mulching for covering uh, large uh, and small uh, greenhouses, semi-permanent and permanent uh, for covering orchards with rain and insects. In addition, there are the plastics used for irrigation and hoses, uh, strings uh, and nets. Plastic film uh, that is spread uh, on the ground uh, to prevent pests from uh, suff um, suffocating commercial crops to heat the soil after winter or to prevent um, water from evaporating. In Italy, uh, agriculture uses more or less uh, 30,000 tons uh, of plastic only for mulching films. Uh, to this is added um, the basis uh, in the fluorovivaistic uh, sex sector. Uh, that probably uh, most of us don't uh, consider, but is the, the, a sector where plastic uh, um, is uh, very used. Modern agriculture cannot do without uh, irrigation, especially in areas uh, where rainfall is scarce or where crops uh, are so sensitive to water stress that the crop is compromised in good weather. And uh, that's how you multiply the pipes uh, in the field. Those of consistent uh, um, diameter last for years, but the small pipes that carry water to individual plants are often disposable. The advantages of uh, using plastic um, for farmers uh, are uh, cultivation uh, of fruit and vegetables, regardless of the season, improved quality of final fruit and vegetable products compared to those grown in the open field with optimization of the timing and yields. More efficient management of water and nutrients in terms of conservation, rainwater collection, storage and distribution in crops. Improved maintenance of thermal conditions over time. Possibility to produce flowers and crops also in desert regions, thanks to photoselectivity. Increased protection against insects, birds and weather conditions. Reduction of the use of pesticides and the presence of weeds. The main variables on which the performance of plastics in the agricultural sectors uh, depends on, for example, uh, color and uh, opacity uh, of the, um, the mulch, uh, the weight uh, of mulch, uh, the distance from the ground. Uh, so um, the characteristics uh, of mulch have different effects uh, on crops. Um, for example, uh, also the color of uh, the mulch is important. Black uh, mulch absorb most of the UV uh, visible and uh, um, sun radiation. Um, so um, it's necessary, uh, according to our opinion, um, to promote um, biodegradability uh, march, uh, but uh, conserving the same technical uh, characteristics. Um, 
the disposable of plastics, uh, uh, like uh, biodegradable materials, uh, um, has a cost for the farmer. Uh, so it's more convenient uh, from an economic point of view to use uh, uh, biodegradable um, materials uh, that are uh, um, put in the land. Uh, and, uh, uh, and this uh, is very important uh, for uh, the sustainability agricultural process uh, of uh, production. Uh, currently, Italian farmers are increasingly uh, interesting, uh, interested in using biodegradable materials uh, since an environmentally sustainable production process is required. Uh, from uh, EU legislation. So the future does not seem to be that uh, uh, of maintaining plastic, but uh, of uh, biodegradable alternative materials. Uh, in this regard, Coldiretti has a, um, uh, an agreement uh, with Novamont, uh, which is uh, the leader company in Italy for the production of bioplastics. In conclusion, uh, plastics used in agriculture are suitable for um, a wide margin of improvement from the point of view of biodegradable solutions and uh, compatible with agricultural needs, since plastic is indispensable for efficient and cutting edge agriculture. Um, so uh, it is important uh, to avoid the accumulation of plastic in the environment, uh, but it is also important um, uh, to promote the use uh, of uh, biodegradable um, materials uh, in uh, agriculture. Um, because it is one uh, of the most important uh, issue uh, about uh, um, the, the contribution of agriculture to uh, the uh, pollution of the environment. Thank you. Thank you very much to Ms. Sacardo for her excellent presentation and indeed highlighting not only the situation of Italian farmers, but reminding me that it comes with a cost for farmers and it's difficult to find the balance. Um, furthermore, now the time is for the Q&A session. I know we run a bit out of time, but still uh, be with us because I can see our uh, commission officials are still here. And the first question is indeed for them, if I might speak up for Miss, sorry to mispronounce your name, Birgit Kjer. Um, her question is, are the commission considering setting thresholds for plastic residues in compost and digestate? If I may, some of it is Silvia Forni from um, European Commission DG Environment. I'm, I frankly don't have the answer because this is related to compost and digestate. So I can, uh, I can put the person uh, in contact with my colleagues uh, dealing with waste in DG Environment. If any other colleagues present here from the European Commission have the answers i'm pretty i'm pretty happy to to listen to it to my knowledge the answer is no but it needs it needs further verification perfect thank you indeed we might not have all the answers right now to the questions but it's always nice to keep a dialogue about them um, furthermore, the question was asked, I think this is in general, towards the panelists, what are the concrete alternatives for plastic in agriculture, if there are any? Maybe I can, I can. Go ahead, Luca, please. Yes, uh, it is a, it is a, very broad questions and of course we need to acknowledge that uh, plastic 
has uh, made a step change in uh, some part of Europe, especially in the possibility of uh, producing certain type of crops. Uh, currently, removing plastics uh, we require uh, shifting the production systems. And this has an implication not only for food production, but also for the assets and economy of, of local farmers. It's a complex issue. Nevertheless, we know from a long, many, many years experience, it is possible to produce food also without plastic. On the other side, we need to acknowledge that in the context of climate change, we need to have alternatives that guarantee resilience of agricultural production, protection of uh, crops from drought, uh, extreme rain events. So I would not say that plastic is the only way, but certainly to match the objective of the European Union, strategic objective, not only about uh, plastic use in agriculture, but about the general objective of the Green Deal. We need to accept that uh, the farming sector and the connected sector, industrial sector, we have to develop a lot of innovation in the incoming year. So uh, sure remember that also the objective is to turn agriculture to be zero uh, net carbon. Uh, so we are uh, at, the, at the verge of a sort of technological and agricultural, new agricultural revolution, if those objectives are to be met. Plastic may be a way to address those or may not. This will also depend on uh, mm -hmm. our assessment. Papillons and Minagre's work we will tell you on a broad perspective, what are the long-term ecological implications? And we hope our voice, uh, our funding will be considered in this debate. Thank you very much. If I could add something from to this as well, I think uh, it's very interesting what Luca said, and as well in, con in taking into consideration the zero pollution and the biodiversity strategy and the farm to fork strategy, we would really uh, like to take into consideration that we do not make the same, with, that we take the precautionary principle here. It was discussed that in food, uh, we only have uh, um, articles on marine food and so uh, about the microplastic accumulation. Yes, it's because in for, for plant-based food, it's very difficult to analyze. So we do still not have the analytics, but we know from several uh, pre-studies that there is and entering that it enters in the food chain as well in the vegetable in the vegetable food chain. So what I would uh, what we are really thinking what would be very important to test before the biodegradable plastics are used and as well the conventional ones to test in field sites in the case study sites where it is going to be used that it there will be degraded for the biodegradable plastic. Yeah, well, so what we know from many experiences is that you test do a lab test, you test two earthworms, which are not even living in the soil, and then end mineralization, and that's it. That doesn't reflect the ecotox test, the ecotoxicology from the products to be tested. So what we really would, I would, I would really give you to think about is if you really want to prove that the, bio, that the biodegradable plastics will be de de degraded to zero after two years, as it was uh, presented by the further speaker. Show this in small plot experiments in the case study site, where it is going to be used. Use uh, approvals based on biogeographic -geo zones, where it is proven that it is completely degraded. And what in the moment I'm really doubting, we don't even have methods, harmonized methods to measure the residues in soils from smaller than 50 million. So how can you know that after two years it's all gone if the methods are not established to see what is really staying in the soils as micro or nanoplastics? And in the whole process of degradation, you can as well call it formation of, mi of microplastics and nanoplastics, because that is what is happening. And please find a method, uh, find a, a way to prove that in where you will apply it, there it will be degraded. And especially in this soil system where it is applied to, it will not be transported beyond and it will as well not affect the soil functions. 
and not only two compost earthworms, which do not at all reflect the soil functions. And the EFSA is now together, we are now together with the EFSA developing new ecotoxicology tests for pesticides in this case, but they can be as well used to test in a holistic approach what is the real effect on the ecosystem soil. Thank you. Can I, can I intervene just a moment to reply to the question of uh, Copa Gojek? Eh? Maybe I ahead. can contribute on that regarding the, the future, 1st January to, uh, 2024, the uh, Waste Framework Directive uh, obl will oblige to uh, collect and uh, uh, all the bio waste of, uh, in the European Union. And uh, this will be a great problem. And uh, in this moment, Italy developed it, uh, massively the, the use of uh, uh, biodegradable plastic bags that is working very well. Uh, we have the information from the consortium of uh, um, uh, composters that say that in uh, three weeks, maximum uh, uh, one month, uh, this material is completely uh, biodegraded. We have also uh, we have received the study of Wageningen uh, confirming this uh, this uh, this results. <clears throat> so uh, and uh, uh, good results. The other, on the other side, we are continuing in uh, uh, every uh, every part of the European Union to collect this organic bio bio waste, uh, household bio waste with uh, conventional plastic bags. And there, the system is obliged to make a mechanical separation of uh, plastics, conventional plastic from the organic. There is a great loss of material. And uh, uh, we don't know what is the, 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 the quantity of conventional plastic that uh, can remain in, 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 the, uh, in, the, in the compost. So, the future is clear. It's going, it is necessary to go in for the collection with uh, biodegradable uh, plastic bags uh, that have, have to be uh, certified, yes, of sure, uh, um, of course. But uh, um, we have also information that uh, there is something, some people that is wrong and uh, uh, put the, the conventional plastic in the bin where there are the, um, uh, the, the bio waste, but uh, it's very, very limited. Uh, I, we received the information that the plastic, the conventional plastic found in the, uh, in the um, compost, uh, yes, in the compost are around 3%. In this case, the uh, composter are obliged to discard this material when they found that there is a conventional plastic, they discard this material. So. The important is that to co welcome communicate to the citizen for the future, and that they finally they will use normally to uh, avoid the, 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 the wrong the wrong and the mixed collection of plastics. Thank you. If I may, I'd like to add something as well, maybe to also uh, respond to uh, Violet, because I think <clears throat> I'm not a scientist, so I. As far as I know, there is currently no method of measuring biodegradation somewhere in the open field. That, to my, to my mind, is not possible because you need to have a closed room to see how this carbon is converted to CO2. If you have an open space, you can't capture the CO2 to measure the biodegradation. That's the only way you can measure biodegradation, to my mind, now. So. Maybe indeed in future there is a better way of measuring this biodegradation, but I think you're making the same mistake as many people are doing is you're again looking for a perfect solution. Try to exclude any kind of risk, but taking into account or possibility of staying at the status quo where we are now working with non biodegradable plastics, which is ending up in the soil and where we know that it makes causes a lot of trouble. So again, I'm not saying that biodegradable plastics are the silver bullet for everything, but they are by far the better solution to thin non-biodegradable mulching fields. So if you want to avoid having problems in the soil, the first thing is you have to do 
is to make sure that thin non biodegradable moisture films will no longer be used. That should be the absolute first step. And only then you can go on and say, let's see how rigid do we need to uh, observe how biodegradable moisture films behave in soil. I agree with you, making additional tests is absolutely fine, but let's not uh, throw out the uh, child with the bathwater. Let's go for the better solution and still keep on searching for the best solution instead of staying where we are now, where we know we're going the wrong way. Thank you very much for this interesting uh, discussion point. Um, just two things. I, I fully agree with you that conventional plastic is not the solution. But I doubt that the only solution is biodegradable plastic, which is not proven to be degraded in the sites where it is applied. applied. Uh, if you want to know whether this plastic, biodegradable plastic, is really decayed, I can go with you to different farmers over Europe. I have seen, and I have seen the soils, and I was shocked, to be honest. And they told me this stuff is sold for us to be degraded, but it does not degrade. And we, and we were, now we can see uh, and look until 50 mu, which would particles test, do we find in them? soil. Would so the, what I would the, suggest the, then is... Uh, Violet, you, yeah. I'm sorry, were there biodegradable product or oxodegradable product? No, biodegradable. Biodegradable uh, from biodegradable. Confirmed? Certified? Con yes. Cert certified to the norm? Yes, certified I'm to the norm. Good. And the problem so I'm very is... very curious to see that. And then to answer your question on on-field yeah. degradation, there is a program ongoing in France uh, uh, on uh, test fields at the South Brittany uh, test facility to, mm -hmm. to monitor the, the, the biodegradation inside of, uh, for three years program started last year. Mm -hmm. So I can give you the contact about that, but uh, we, we are doing uh, field studies on mm -hmm. biodegradation on site in test facilities. So, uh, this is, so, yeah, this is, so we, we, we can exchange uh, mm -hmm. on that and then uh, I agree with us. So the question for conventional films is thin films. Uh, I had a discussion with a, a, a polymer producer uh, that wanted that we are starting a collaboration to increase the resistance of bulge films in order to ease the collection with dedicated machines in order to uh, to reach a hundred percent collection rate. At, with conventional plastics with the appropriate uh, uh, thickness. And I think, as I also say, that we, we can't manage both. So I have products uh, very thin and biodegradable when needed. And if biodegradation is not suitable because you need a, a, a wide length of use for the product, we can have conventional plastics with appropriate machines, with appropriate formulations that uh, allow to to, to retrieve 100% of what is put uh, on the soil. But I agree, we, we have to improve that. But we can improve the, the, the we, we have already machine working in France where we were able to reduce the, the, the soil age of the plastic from 80 to 30%. So the lowering of three times the, 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 the content of soil that was coming with the plastic. So solution does exist. Uh, if we give the opportunity to spread it across Europe. So thank you. Thank you very much from Xavier Ferry's intervention as well. Now, I see that the debate is ongoing and it's great to have it, but unfortunately we're running out of time. So now yeah. I would like to give the floor to Dr. Luca Nileto to give a final conclusion on behalf of the Papillons project. Luca, please go ahead. Yes, maybe I, I saw Demetris Briasolis wanted to add something. I will leave him, give him the chance. Sorry, I think. Yeah. Uh, uh, very sorry, short. Luca. Uh, sorry? Hi, uh, I'm Demetrios. You... Uh, I'm sorry, I'm conf confusing. My, I, I saw a message before and please. Okay. Can I intervene for a few minutes? Of course. Uh, there is a question about uh, agricultural plastics or uh, another solution, no agricultural plastics, uh, a question in, uh, in the chat. 
uh, I think this is not uh, a real issue. The question is, how do we manage agricultural plastics? Because agricultural plastics are going to be used, and they will be used, it must be used for uh, agriculture, but in a sustainable way. Uh, and uh, the problem of microplastics uh, pollution of soil is a big issue. We're going to deal with this in the framework of uh, Papillon and uh, the other project also. Uh, but uh, the key question about this problem is not just what are the implications, the impacts of microplastic in soil, but uh, how can we prevent pollution uh, from agricultural plastics? So in order to solve a problem, the first thing that you have to do is to define the problem precisely. What is the problem? How are we using the agricultural plastics? And why do we have soil pollution? And the answer is mainly because of agricultural plastic waste mismanagement. It, this is a topic for which we worked with Label Agri Waste, a European project, uh, some years ago. Uh, and we proposed to DG Environment, to DG Agriculture, and to DG Enterprise uh, back in 2013. I think a European proposed uh, label uh, agri waste labeling scheme for the sustainable management and the valorization of the agricultural plastic waste. Because in the majority, this waste is not waste, but it is a very valuable recyclable mat uh, material which is homogeneous because. It is collected in specific uh, time uh, within the year. And so you can collect greenhouse films, for example, uh, homogeneous big quantities of this material, and recycle them, and reuse them. And so uh, the main issue is how you are going to do that at the European level. The problems we encounter are two. The first one is we do not have in Europe official data for agricultural plastics. And the second is that we do not have in Europe organized system for collection and valorization of these valuable products. So we propose the solution, but this proposal has not been, uh, has not found a way through the European Commission's uh, system of uh, uh, parliament and so on, the, the bureaucracy anyway, but it is still there. It can be utilized because the importers, the producers of agricultural plastics right now uh, are not, do not be, belong to a stream uh, of waste, which is agricultural plastic waste for which they will be involved along with other stakeholders, farmers, and so on, uh, in the way uh, other stakeholders for batteries, for uh, tires, for uh, packaging are involved. They pay a fee for the sustainable management of waste. And in this way, uh, the materials and the statistics of the products of agricultural plastics in agriculture in Europe will be collected and recorded and monitored. This is the key problem. Uh, the DG environment has the responsibility to proceed in this way. Otherwise, we are going to speak for decades about pollution, about problems, about this kind of, of uh, issues we discussed today. The second uh, problem is about the non-recyclable agricultural plastics. It, the main category is motion films. These films are non-recyclable. This has been uh, investigated experimentally with pi pilot uh, uh, studies in several countries in Europe with uh, experiments for recycling, for energy recovery, and so on. And uh, the main pollution of soil from agricultural plastics comes from mismanagement practices. And one big 
factor is uh, the conventional mutant film and also oxodegradable, which are now banned anyway uh, films. The questions about biodegradability of uh, biodegradable in soil certified as such mulching film uh, can be answered only through very systematic research, not by going to the farms and looking what happens here and there. This is not a systematic research because you cannot, you do not know the management, what kind of material, uh, what has happened there. And uh, following a very long period of intensive research on this issue, we can uh, tell you that biodegradable in soil uh, mulching films are a safe, or a safe way to apply agricultural plastic uh, mulching films without having problems because biodegradation is not static. It is not something stable within the year. Uh, we have investigated the different factors affecting biodegradation in soil. You may be in Southern Europe, it have nice uh, temperature, but dry soil because of lack of rain. During that period, the material will not biodegrade, but when rain comes, it will start speeding up biodegradation and so on. You may have hot, uh, mild conditions in summer in Finland, and you can have by degradation and so on. So it's not so oversimplified question like agricultural plastic or not, by degradable or non by, by degradable and so on. That is Thank my you very much, intervention. Dimitri. Thank you very much. That was very clear and is pretty much in line with the other, the other Dimitrios that uh, you post uh, your perspective, of course. Uh, the point here is to is not a complex is not a simple issue there is a lot of variable what uh, my impression is that the margin for improving the management of agricultural plastic use is very large so we are uh, starting from a pretty much a basic level here so there is margin to get to make a more sustainable use we need to define sustainability in clear terms and maybe criteria for sustainability are not readily available. And I think uh, in this forum, we have a good chance to work on that um, together. Um, in conclusion, I'm extremely grateful for all the contributors here. For, uh, for us, it's uh, very precious to hear uh, your perspective, your vision. There are opposing interests Papa? here as well. And I hope uh, it is... Papa? It is clear for everyone uh, that uh, our mission is to look at a holistic uh, perspective over the ecosystem uh, responses to this potential stress deriving from plastic pollution. In doing that, we will analyze uh, toxicological responses of uh, soil biota and crops two different types of plastic, including biodegradable and non-biodegradable over a long-term perspective. It is also very precious and I am very, I'm very thankful to Violette to present in Minagres here. I think that uh, in future we should uh, uh, try to organize these uh, meetings jointly because we are addressing the same group of stakeholders. We have common interests. So Violette, we will discuss to, how to create a Minagres slash Papillon uh, common forum for discussion and engage with this uh, with this actor present today together. So I also finally want to give a special thank to all the speakers today. Uh, we will try to take advantage of what you said here. We're planning to, to make proceedings and make them available through our website. I also want to thank uh, my collaborator here, especially Shabols Soldretti at Farm Europe that uh, has been uh, chairing this section. I want to thank uh, Raisa Markov and Martine Wolder for uh, their support in organizing the meeting technically. A special thank to Anne Denninger, the project manager of uh, Papillons. You are great. You are doing a fantastic job here. And yes, thank you very much. We will be in touch with you. We look forward to convey to you 
our findings and our discoveries over the uh, ecosystem effects of plastic pollution in soil. Thank you very much. Indeed, thank you. I think Luca has said everything that needs to be said on my behalf as well. So thank you once again for the speakers, for the interventions and for the work of the teams behind making this a possibility. We will keep in touch with you. You can find our email address and social media accounts down here. So please feel free to engage with us and follow up. We will do some next steps in outreach, sending you service. How did you like the events? And to make sure that you know about our next publication and steps. But I wish not to further delay your lunch break. Please make sure you do not find micro nanoplastic in your food. And with that, I would like to conclude this event. Thank you very much for everyone's excellent contribution and see you soon. Have a lovely afternoon. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.